This program has been made possible in part by the following sponsors. David and Mark Goodman. The Vancouver Courier Newspaper. Vancouver Lawyers, Dumoulin Boscovich. We'd like to call prostitution the world's oldest profession. And perhaps when we use that phrase, we use it with a kind of sad irony. Is it indeed a profession? Uh, prostitutes are called working girls uh, and a whole bunch of other names, some of them not very salutary. Uh, there's no question that it's a dangerous occupation. There's also no question that the great majority of prostitutes are also drug addicted in some form or other. Uh, there is a move afoot in Canada to change the laws. Uh, that move attempts to provide greater safety to prostitutes that, uh, as a result of many things, not the least of which was uh, a character named Robert Picton. We don't have to go on about that. Uh, Pivot Legal Society here in Vancouver does a, a number of things uh, focused often in the downtown east side. And Katrina Pacey is a lawyer working with Pivot Legal Society, and she's here to help us understand what are, in some ways, very contradictory laws. Katrina, thanks for joining us. Thank I, you for I, I don't me. really understand uh, the legal situation as it stands today, if nothing changed, mm -hmm. what would, what's the law right now? So right now, the actual exchange of sexual services for compensation is legal. So that transaction has never been illegal in Canada. What is illegal is um, to communicate for the purposes of prostitution in a public place. That's more commonly referred to as street solicitation. In a public place? In a public is place. Is that phrase in the, in the law? That's in the law. So if you're in private and you're communicating for the purposes of prostitution, yeah. you're okay. Um, body houses, or yeah. more commonly known as brothels, are yeah. also illegal, and it's illegal to operate one or be found in one or to keep a common body house. And it's also um, against the law in the Criminal Code of Canada to procure, which is um, intended to capture pimps or anyone yes. who's in a kind of management role, yes. live on the avails of prostitution. And then, of course, in addition to that, there are provisions that relate to persons under the age of 18. So there's explicit um, prohibitions against buying sex from um, people under the age of 18, children, yes. sexually exploited children and youth. Yeah. So if I and another person, for some reason or other, decide we're going to have sex this afternoon and there's an exchange of money, but that conversation has happened, chez nous, has happened between us, Andre, mm -hmm. uh, no problem. That's, that that that's would be um, not against the law, except yeah. if um, one of you used yes. a space such as an apartment yes. m multiple times for the purpose of sexual um, uh -huh. services, then that becomes a brothel and that space is now prohibited. So um, okay. the only way really at, under, these, under the current legislation um, to uh, provide sexual services and sell sexual services um, without breaking the law is to communicate in private about it, but then to do what sex workers refer to as out calls, so to go out and meet clients elsewhere. Yes. Um, if you have clients come in to see you at your place of work or at your home, then your home or place of work becomes a brothel and it's against the law. Now, now how much, before we get into who's trying to change the law and why and how, um, how much in practice do police uh, bother with prostitution laws? Because certainly we know that by and large, uh, police largely just shrug their shoulders at, at marijuana usage, at least usage, maybe mm -hmm. not growing. But you know, I, I phoned my son the other day, I parked my car in Beach Avenue for a moment, mm -hmm. and I said, hey Sean, I'm on Beach Avenue, I'm getting a contact, hi. <laughs> <laughs> parking my car mm -hmm. uh, and he said well that's all over the city dad yeah yeah so um, the sort of level of enforcement in Vancouver and that's where what I know best yes. has definitely changed over the years so there have been periods where there's been significant enforcement particularly against street-based sex work so there's been at, at certain points in time and in particular during times where we've seen really high levels of violence against sex workers yes, yes. a lot of um, targeting of street-based sex workers and their clients. Um, right now, I would say that the practice in Vancouver is that there isn't a high level of enforcement against street-level sex work, yes. in part because I think even the police are 
starting to recognize that arresting um, really vulnerable sex workers is not helping anybody, that in fact it's putting them um, both within the criminal justice system and at further risk. Let me ask you something that just occurred to me, just mm -hmm. talking about this, got me thinking about uh, in your experience, or and or from evidence or anything you've ever read, what's the incidence of violence against prostitutes in general? Has anybody ever mm -hmm. come up with a sort of number? Um, you know, there's the sort of data about the sex industry at large yes. overall is really hard to come by because what we know is that a lot of the industry operates kind of underground and in private and, and behind closed doors and sex workers don't come forward very often because they're criminalized and for various other reasons to disclose the nature of their work. What we do know with certainty is that there are um, extremely high levels of violence um, for those working at street level and as a person who's been working for the last decade in the downtown east side I don't think I've ever met a sex worker who hasn't ex had an experience of violence um, in the context of street-based work. What we also know, though, is that the off-street industries, so escort agencies, massage yes. parlors, have significantly less violence. Less. And this is what we know the courts in Ontario are now grappling with is, yes. can we look at the indoor industry, the relative safety that is there, and say that there's a safe way for sex work to be practiced? Yeah, I just, you know, as we were talking, I just had this thought that, that uh, people who buy the services of prostitutes for whatever reasons, I shouldn't cast dispersions on, uh, on all buyers, but by and large probably are not that great at relationships. Uh, and if they're not that great at relationships, uh, there's a good chance that there is hidden rage, uh, angers, resentments, and, and it would be very simple, I suddenly imagine, mm -hmm. for this encounter to turn ugly. Well, there is actually research out of Vancouver about the level to which um, clients are violent or have a propensity to violence. And the numbers are actually very low. Per, you know, the percentage of those is, is less than 5% oh, of those oh, who actually okay. have a propensity to any type of violence oh, um, in well, the context, good. which is great. Yeah. But what we know is that the experience of sex workers yes. is that, and especially those working at street level, yeah. is that their experience of violence is very high. And so the, um, what we are working towards, and many sex workers across the country are working towards, is to increase the level of control that sex workers have over the conditions of their work. Right. because it maybe there would just be a few perpetrators out there but what sex workers need to be able to do is control for that uh, and make yeah. sure they're in the safest possible circumstances can go to police when violence yeah, arises. A few, a few dozen count because one nuclear bomb could ru ruin your day. Yeah, What's yeah, important yeah, yeah. is that sex workers are able to prevent that from happening. So uh, a gal named Joyce Smith uh, she's a backbencher for mm -hmm. the Conservative Party out of Winnipeg and uh, she wants to change the law Mm -hmm. And wh what is? How does she want to change it? So what she and she's been she's been very good at. at mm -hmm. Normally, backbenchers don't get anywhere, mm -hmm. but she has a track record of success. Yeah. yeah. So what um, what uh, Joy Smith is trying to achieve is a new. Um, framework within the criminal code that would criminalize the purchasing of sexual services. And this is a model that's been adopted in Sweden and in a number of Nordic countries and is being kind of watched and looked at from around the world. The um, problem with that model and the reason that we at Pivot and Sex Workers Nationally are not fighting for this type of um, scenario oh. is that the impact of this legal framework would be the same as what we have now. Um, if you are criminalizing clients, yes. if we look at the street level trade, sex workers will still be displaced um, into the darker, more isolated corners of the city where even if it's their clients that are being chased by police, the sex workers will go where they need to go to protect those clients from yep. enforcement. Um, sex workers will still feel rushed to get into vehicles without having time to screen clients. So what we um, look at when we look at that um, framework is we say what's the impact going to be? Will it be any different than what we have now? And the example and the kind of experience in Sweden and what we know under the current legal framework is that it would actually replicate the violence that we're seeing now. It would replicate um, the level to which sex workers lose control over the conditions of their work. So uh, Daphne Abramo, one of the uh, familiar editorial writers of The mm -hmm. Sun, wrote a, a good piece about this uh, just earlier this month and she says uh, that people argue that decriminalization legalization is a form of harm reduction mm -hmm. that won't lead to an expansion of the country's sex industry and then there's a the crucial part she says even though that contradicts the experience of countries and states where more brothels more prostitution more human trafficking have resulted following legalization 
Yeah, you know, it's people throw a lot of numbers around and a lot of statistics, and, and in fact, I just would say that's not borne out by the evidence. And so we've had, um, as an example, this huge trial that took place um, in Ontario where they looked at the criminal laws, because yep. the laws are federal, so they were looking yep. at the same laws that we're um, talking about here, and they looked at exactly what has happened internationally and locally, and looked at the evidence and the um, experience in all these other countries. And what they found is that there wasn't an increase, there wasn't a proliferation of prostitution that what there has been in countries that have decriminalized, and New Zealand is a really good example of, of a truly decriminalized model, um, is that sex workers had greater access to the, control the conditions of their work, including the ability to work in smaller, um, let's call them smaller units of workers, um, where they could support one another and work more collectively as opposed to working for a big brothel. Um, they had greater access to police protection, mm. uh, a greater sense of personal dignity, um, as well as the ability to access social services in a way they hadn't before. I'm glad you raised the issue of dignity because mm -hmm. sooner or later I was going to get into that mm -hmm. issue. Uh, what do you say to people who say, look, this is, this is an undignified uh, activity uh, under any circumstances. Basically what you're talking about is mostly women but sometimes men, mm -hmm. young men, uh, renting out body parts by the hour. Mm -hmm. How could that possibly be dignified? Well, the reality is that if you had, you know, a community of sex workers here, and I wish yeah. they were here and could speak for themselves yeah. and it didn't yeah. have to be me, yeah. um, uh, speaking about their experience, you would find that there was a breadth of experience within that. At some, at one end of the spectrum, and the women I work with would certainly say um, that they would um, love to be in some other line of work. There's yes. many women in yes. the industry and men as well sure. who would choose something else if given the opportunity if their life circumstances were different. Right. And at the other end of the spectrum, you will have sex workers who say, this is what I choose to do. Um, I don't judge you for who you decide to sleep with at night um, and so why are you judging me this is a decision I'm making as an adult person about who I sleep with and under what circumstances and what we need to do is we need to understand that diversity of experience we need to understand that as a Canadian society we've decided adults get to decide who they sleep with as long as it's consensual and for those who are involved in sex work as a result of desperate circumstances or coerced circumstances or exploitation yeah. um, we need to look at those conditions we need to say how can we support those women and those men in those circumstances um, to you know uh, improve the conditions of their lives so that they can um, transition out of sex work and what we say in my experience working with sex workers is those who do want to transition out of sex work say the criminal laws are not helping them it's increasing the harm they experience while they're in the industry. They leave with criminal records, and then when they right. go to try to, you know, if they are able to deal with the addiction issues that they may be struggling with, or mental health struggles, or lack of housing, whatever it may be, yeah, when housing, they, education. When they go right? to actually go and get that yeah. job, and they have uh, communicating for the purposes yes. conviction on their record, it does nothing. It doesn't help. No. Uh, all right. Well, we'll talk about choice in a moment, and, and now we'll choose to take a little break and remind you that uh, davidburner.com is the website to go to for emails, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and the usual social media. And uh, we take a moment to thank our uh, uh, kind sponsors who uh, help us bring this program to you here on Shaw Community TV, Cable 4. KCM Wealth Management. Vancouver Lawyers, Dumoulin Boscovich. The Vancouver Courier Newspaper. David and Mark Goodman. All right, our guest is Katrina Pacey with the Pivot Legal Society. The question is, should we legalize uh, prostitution? And I should tell you, uh, Katrina, that uh, I have many interests in this subject. And one is that uh, I uh, created the first treatment center for addicts in Canada mm -hmm. uh, here in Vancouver 40 some years ago, 45 mm -hmm. years ago. And, and so I worked with many prostitutes, and I know many women who are prostitutes. Um, and every single one of them 
would say, this was my choice. Mm -hmm. It was a crummy choice, but it's one I made. Uh, and they, none of them had excuses about those choices. All, pretty much every one of them was addicted to something, mostly heroin, but also booze, pills, whatever. And every one of them was very happy to leave the life, mm -hmm. knowing also that it was hard work. Mm -hmm. You don't just step out. It's not as easy. You make the choice, but it's someone like, somewhat like going to university. It takes years. You've got to mm -hmm. work at it, right? Sure. Yeah. 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 And that's the question we have to ask ourselves is for the women you were working with, yes. obviously um, working through their addiction and being able to, you know, deal with that aspect of their own personal struggle was yes. an element of their ability to meet their goals. And, that, and their goal was to transition out of sex work. So what do, you, what do you make of this group whom I've met? I had them uh, uh, do a... a it turned out it wasn't a debate. Mm. In fact, it may have been Pivot who was angry at us because I didn't have an opposite side. But I had these four women do a public forum mm -hmm. uh, some year, a couple of years ago at the library, Resist Exploitation, Embrace Dignity. Mm -hmm. And they're very interesting people, very strong women, very uh, clear-minded and intellectual, some of them very passionate, all of them passionate, some more emotional than others. And, and you know, their, their position was, look, we have to do whatever we can to end prostitution. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, I'm not a Christian, but I think it was Jesus who said, the poor shall always be amongst ye, and, and prostitution will always be around. Uh, uh, so working to eliminate it is a, is a, is a tough job. Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, what do you think of this approach, resist exploitation, embrace dignity? Well, um, we are, I would say, on opposite ends of the debate, or opposite sides yes, of this debate, yes. um, because the, um, sort of approach that they're saying um, and that those groups are are promoting is one that criminalizes aspects of the industry, criminalizes clients, and criminalizes those who are involved in any type of management role. And um, my concern and the concern of the women that I work with is just that that won't promote their safety. That won't allow for sex workers today to uh, work in conditions where their lives um, will be saved and could be saved if they were at risk of you know extreme violence like they are. And so um, there's a practical aspect to this, which is that yes. we are about saving lives and we are working towards uh, allowing those workers to have the type of safety that they need. The other aspect of this is that I would say that in my experience um, working with workers, sex workers across the country and internationally, is that um, there are sex workers who say they choose to do this, um, that will, um, that choose to do this under the current criminalized framework yes. and would choose to do this under any framework who I um, would say have the right to uh, decide under what circumstances they do that work and to do so safely. I, I don't question that. I don't mm -hmm. question that people have, have the right mm -hmm. to be prostitutes and I don't I don't judge uh, men or women who choose to be prostitutes. Uh, I'm just saying that in my experience, I never met one who wanted to stay there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can, I can understand there would be some who would say, hey, I like this. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a good deal for me. I'm glad you raised the issue of safety because so has a Vancouver City Councilor who's in the psychological business. Uh, and he says, we can help you get out of the trade and be safe. And I don't understand, he, he made this statement, on CTV on the 24th of June, and I don't understand what he means by this. Uh, of course, I often don't understand what this guy means by anything. <laughs> but anyways, we can help you get out of the trade and be safe, uh, but you don't have to answer for him. My mm -hmm. question is, if we make prostitutes safe, are we helping them stay in the trade? Mm -hmm. Um, my answer is that we are all extremely motivated to make sure that nobody is forced into sex work as a result of desperate circumstances or coercion. Um, and what we need to do and what Pivot is doing and I think other groups are doing very well is talking to sex workers about what their needs are um, to meet their own personal goals. For many, that's transitioning into sex work. And those women are telling me that what they need is access to greater, you know, better social assistance, access to um, addiction treatment and detox, access to safe and affordable housing, um, the ability to reconnect with their children um, access to education, access to professional development and, and, and educational opportunities, and that is actually the context. So even if they were involved in sex work yes. um, at the moment, yes, yes. what they need is all of those supports and services to um, help them think about what their goals are, and, and, and criminalization just is yes. getting them um, nowhere near those goals. It, it, it's an extra impediment that is unnecessary is what you're saying. It's, it's not helpful. That's right and what yeah. we know is that it's increasing the harms for them while they're there and and the reality is that I um, the in the international kind of 
contexts that we've looked at, there are um, not circumstances where prostitution is proliferated. It may be a bit more visible in certain circumstances because sex yes. workers are more likely to come forward to the police, are more likely to come forward to services because they're no longer criminalized. Um, but the actual numbers in prostitution do not increase. Uh, it, let's talk about the issue of harm reduction because I agree with you, of course, that you, we want to do everything we can, if we can, mm -hmm. uh, to work on housing, addictions treatment, uh, uh, contact with your children, responsibility, blah, 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 and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's a bit to me like the drug addiction story. Mm -hmm. uh, you and I have probably fallen opposite sides of this argument. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, of harm reduction. In fact, I do, basically don't like it. Mm -hmm. uh, most harm reduction measures. Uh, I don't want to keep addicts comfortable or safe. Mm -hmm. You know, for my money as a citizen, I want to do everything I can to say, look, I, I want to help you out of this life mm -hmm. because it's, it's an undignified, miserable life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a fully human life. Uh, so I, I would look for the same thing with, with prostitutes. So, so, you know, my, my concern is how much in a practical sense, Katrina, are you seeing from your vantage point people doing this how you know i know the landscape of addiction treatment services in this province mm -hmm. it's pretty sparse compared to the need what I will say is that as we fight for decriminalization, as we fight for um, that ability to work safely, we need to put equal energy into the fight to alleviate poverty and end, you know, discrimination yeah. and and yeah. and you know, obviously end feminization of poverty and the level of discrimination that women experience. Oh, more generally. feminization of poverty. And yeah, that's a very that's uh, these are all yeah, yeah. part of the same fight. Yeah. And of course, Pivot and everyone else, we're all about equality, we're all about yeah, human yeah, dignity, yeah. and we're all about choice. Yeah. And so I think we're actually on the same page. The different the difference may be that what I hope for is a world where we um, fight for all of those social reforms, but that once we achieve those social reforms and that the income assistance rate is increased and there's safe and affordable housing for all people and we've achieved those with things that I think are all human rights, that those women who are going to be able to enjoy those benefits are, do not have HIV, have not experienced yes. egregious violence, are not dead and in dumpsters, frankly, and yeah, that's yeah, what we yeah, have yeah. right now. So for me, this is about, and for the sex workers I work with, this is about saving their lives and allowing them and empowering them to be part of this fight for a better society for everyone. Uh, yeah, no, I look, I, I understand, I understand it on a gut level because one of Picton's victims was a friend of mine. Mm. Uh, so I, I understand it very much. This is a mm -hmm. person that I knew when she was a child mm -hmm. and, and her life just didn't go the way it might. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but again, I, I, I wonder when you're talking to uh, these young women and, and men, uh, if we, let, let's say, you know, somebody named Gail says, yeah, I, I, I need addiction services. Mm -hmm. Are you on the spot able to actually do anything? Are you finding it? What do I do when that you situation or, happens? You or friends in the business at Pivot? Or well, we say, look, we need to work hard to get you on every wait list, talk uh -huh. to every detox. Once you get on the detox list, you're going to have to call every day. You know, we know what those steps are. Oh and we, we do Listen. everything we can to empower, you know, every person that we work with um, to the extent that we can with our eight staff members. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we are part of all of those attempts and all of those efforts for sure. So um, we basically listen to people in the community we ask them what they need and we move forward based on their vision for both social change and their own personal change. I think there's a very subtle fine line between providing a kind of approval for being a drug addict or a prostitute mm -hmm. and a fine line between sort of giving a kind of stamp of approval and saying it's, it's okay and saying uh, look, I'm not judging you. Mm -hmm. I don't judge you because you use drugs I, uh, or, or because you choose to work as a prostitute. I'm, but I am saying, as, as a friend or another human being, mm -hmm. I think it's a waste of your life. I think it's a dopey activity. Mm -hmm. I, think, it's, I think it's a very, isn't that a fine line? Well, I mean, yeah. what my conversations with sex workers look a bit more like this. I'm not going to judge you for um, what you're doing with your life right now because I'm yes. not in your shoes. Okay. I have no idea what your life experience is yep. and it's probably very different than mine as a person with relative privilege. Yes. What I'm going to do is ask you what you need right now and help you achieve those goals. And if your goals are to work safely right now, 
um, so that you can explore all of those opportunities, I'm going to help you achieve that. And I'm not saying that because um, I'm you know approving why I make or disapproving. A funny face? Sure. You know why I make a funny face? Sure. Because in my experience, too often, mm -hmm. people in that position don't in fact know what they need and they'll, mm -hmm. they'll tell you something they need and it's just about the worst thing they could think you could think of. Yeah, it hasn't yeah. been my experience. I mean, really? I work with women yeah. in the downtown east yes. side who yeah. say very well, I hope to never have to go out and stand on that corner ah. ever again. I would, if you gave me, you know, a door out of here right now, I would take it. Let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about the politics. Are you, is Pivot, are others doing the other thing, I, I hear what you're doing here, mm -hmm. are you saying repeatedly to these governments, I'm talking about Victoria and, and uh, Ottawa, mm -hmm. I, don't think, I don't think the puppet mayor can do much, mm -hmm. but, but are you saying, look, we're busting our buns trying to help these folks, mm -hmm. there aren't enough beds, there aren't enough places for treatment. They have Absolutely. to phone every week to get into detox. Absolutely. Are you saying that? Absolutely. Tell I mean, me about those I mean, conversations. I mean, we are part of the fight for all of the sort of pillars of yes. that we think are important. Yes, yes. One being harm reduction, and I think yeah. you know that Pivot supports harm reduction, yeah. and all the way through to effective detox and treatment. Yeah, yeah. Um, we know that detox and treatment um, in this province yes. and in the city of Vancouver is wholly inadequate in terms of women's needs. It's based on, in many cases, a male model of treatment as well as they're just being inadequate beds. I, I, that I don't understand because I happen to know several wonderful mm -hmm. agencies that deal exclusively with women. I, I would say that yeah. there are for yeah, sure, yeah. but in certain circumstances you have models of treatment where um, there are co-ed treatment facilities or yeah. where you just don't have the type of staffing to really understand women's particular needs. For example, some women in the community say, um, I'm not sure I can go into a treatment or sorry, into a yeah. detox environment where I can't have contact with my children. Um, I need to be able to maintain that phone contact. I or agree, that kind of they're thing. right. So, but there are certain environments where that's, so, so I'm, I mean, what I'm saying is that um, I'm agreeing with you that what we need to do is really look at um, expanding all of those types of services. I'm patting myself on the back because when we ran our center, my ex-wife created a daycare. Mm -hmm. So we had it all going. Right, yeah, and there's, yeah, I think, yeah. eight beds in the province where you can go with your children, as an example. Katrina, thanks so much. Mm, thank Great you to very talk much. To you. Great okay. to talk to you. <laughs> Folks, that's it. Oh, what a difficult, gruesome, but important subject. Think about it. Uh, DavidBurner.com. And next week, we do a complete about face. Almost everything. This is our 22nd, 23rd show. I can't remember. And next week, uh, our last show before we do some reruns during August, uh, we do something from not public affairs, showbiz. Uh, our good friend James Wright, who is the brilliant uh, general manager of Vancouver Opera, will join us. And he's got some fantastic news, and he's doing some great work in the operas, better than it's ever been. So I'll spare you. I won't sing. Thanks for being with us uh, here on Shaw Community TV, uh, Channel 4.